In the sackback sequence, I explained that Windsor chairs begin with the seat. The seat is what made Windsor construction possible. It's a solid block of wood in the middle of the chair into which the back and the legs are connected. So all of Windsor, uh, all Windsor chairs have this in common, a solid wooden seat. And while they have the solid wooden seat in common, there is a whole lot of variation in the seats. And if we're gonna understand Windsor's and talk about Windsor's, then we ought to spend some time talking about the various types of seats that were used in Windsor chairs. Windsor's were introduced in Philadelphia in the 1740s, and by the 1750s had kind of gained traction and were becoming popular. The first Windsor chairs looked a lot like this one right here. And the seat shape was what we call a D seat because the shape of the seat is basically like the capital letter D. The first chairs were more semi-circular, but they have in common with all other D seats a straight front edge. Windsor chairs began to spread throughout the colonies and were introduced into New England in Rhode Island. And the first Windsor chairs in Rhode Island looked a lot like this one here, this low back Windsor chair. It too has a D seat because it dates to the 1760s, the mid 18th century, along with this chair here. However, the seat has changed. It's now, it's, instead of being based on a circle, being semi-circular, it is more of a rectangle with rounded corners, but it retains that same characteristic of looking like the capital letter D. All the shapes of Windsor chair seats are adaptable, and the same occurs with the D. Here it is used as a writing arm chair. An extension is added to it, for a third stump which supports the tablet. But yet there is the characteristic D-shaped seat with its straight front edge. The seat is further adaptable, as are all Windsor chair seats, into use as a settee, which you see here in this low back settee that would date from about the 1760s uh, in Philadelphia. Um, the seat, again, Characteristic D shape uh, based on the rectangle with the straight front edge. By the mid 18th century, by the 1760s, Windsor chair making is well established as a craft, and Windsor chair makers begin to branch out and develop new designs. The chair they introduce in the 1760s is the classic of Windsor chairs, the sackback. In order to make a sackback, there had to be a new a shape of seat. And the seat that was introduced is the oval. Sackbacks would be made for the next 40 years, well into to, uh, up to 1800, and they would always retain this classic oval shape. Now the oval can be used in other chairs as well. It is in this Nantucket fan back that you see here, a very large commodious chair like the early um, Philadelphia high backs. It was a type of chair referred to as an easy chair. Remember the extension on the writing arm chair the, that came off the side of the chair and was used to support the tablet. In the back of this chair, the chairmaker has included two bracing spindles to support the back, and that requires an extension on the back of the seat. Now, because the grain runs side to side in an oval seat, to put an extension off the back requires that the, the material from which the extension is shaped be mortise and tenoned into the back of the seat. So this seat actually has two pieces the tailpiece is a separate piece of wood from the seat. Like all other shapes of Windsor seats, the oval seat can be adapted into a settee. Here's an example with the seat expanded in order to make a two-seater.
The sackback introduced in the 17, late 1760s was so popular and were made in such very large numbers that Windsor chair making became firmly established as a craft. And these new Windsor chair makers began to look for other ways or for other chairs that they could create to expand their offerings. A natural is a side chair. And so Windsor chair makers did that. They began to offer side chairs. 18th century side chairs had shield shaped seats. It's a new shape of seat and it's just as its name implies. It's shaped like a shield. The shield seats in Windsor chairs are very sensual. Different areas interpret them in different ways. In Massachusetts, around Boston and the South Shore, the chair seats were very muscular and, and robust, as seen here in this fan back from the Boston area from the, about the 1780s. The same with this balloon back chair from about 1790 in the Boston area, very muscular seats. Other regions made their shield seats very light and delicate, almost wafer-like. And you can see that in this New York City bowback side chair from about 1790. A very thin seat pulled out so that it looks, the front edge is just a line that your eye can follow. The 1790s, chairmakers in New York introduced the continuous arm, again with a shield seat and a very, very light and delicate uh, uh, front edge. The shield was used in Philadelphia as well. This high back, which dates from the 1770s, has a very similar shape to the continuous arm. Just as the Nantucket fan back, where there were bracing spindles to support the back, chair makers, in some cases, added braces to their chairs to give them extra strength. The grain in a shield seat always goes front to back. And so the tail pieces, the extensions that have the bracing spindles connected to them in a shield seat, so it's an integral piece of the original block of wood. It is created by cutting out that shape out of, a, out of the seat blank rather than by attaching an extension as with the, the oval seat. In the 1790s, Windsor chairmakers introduced a new concept to their work, and that was chairs made en suite. That's a French term, and it simply means in sets. So Windsor chairmakers, for the first time, began to make armchairs that matched the side chairs. And the seats they were using were shield seats, and as a result, changes were made in the seats to uh, accommodate both an arm and a side. And so here are two Rhode Island bowback Windsor chairs, uh, uh, an armchair and a side chair. When you look at the armchair, it's the same shape, but the rounded back extends further to accommodate the two stumps. The side chair, since it only uh, has to accommodate the, the joints for the bow, that curved back is more shallow. About 1800, Windsor chair making underwent another transition, and that was the introduction of square backed chairs. These chairs have styles and the characteristic square back. The finish on these chairs and the decoration also became important, and so attention shifted from the sensuous seats that were popular in the previous century to a more restrained seat that you see here in these, these, these birdcage Windsor chairs. At the same time, Windsor chairmakers went crazy with this concept of chairs made en suite. So you no longer had just matching armchairs and side chairs. A house might have matching armchairs, side chairs, rocking chair, and settees throughout many rooms. 
So Windsor Chairmakers began to sell these chairs in very large numbers, a couple of dozen to a set. Once again, the seat has to change to accommodate its function. The armchair seat is much bigger than the side chair seat, and once again, the curve comes around much farther in the back to accommodate the two stumps that you see here. In the side chair, the seat is actually quite small and uh, uh, only has to come around far enough, this curve only has to come far and far enough to accommodate the two styles. As I say, these were made en suite in large numbers and so squareback settees are also uh, uh, prevalent. And the seat, the shield seat used for the side and the armchair is adaptable and can be expanded into a settee, as you see here, all retaining the shield seat. As time progressed, Windsor chairs changed again. The seats became more amorphous in the 19th century. It may be because Windsor chair makers were under intense pressure from fancy chair makers, or it may be that in order to produce Windsor chairs in the very, very large numbers that were made, less time could be spent on a seat. By 1805, seats were beginning to simplify a lot, uh, as seen in this chair from Beverly, Massachusetts. The chair seat becomes even more simple on this chair here from southeastern New Hampshire about 1815 to 1820. This chair here dates very tightly to 1825 from Lexington, Kentucky, and as you can see the seat has become very simple. But they all retain that shield shape. Thank you for watching this content. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to this channel. And check back frequently for more Windsor chair making tips and tutorials.